Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to talk about the three best practices I don't actually use anymore. Those are things I've used to use in the past and I've even talked about in this channel in the past as far as four years ago, but nowadays I don't follow at all. And in this video I'm going to explain why I don't use them and what I do instead. Now please keep in mind that if you are using any of those, it doesn't mean that you should not be using them. Those are things that I just don't use and they don't work for my coding style, but if they work for you, don't touch them. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out my courses on dometrain.com. All right, let's go to the first thing, which is actually something I showed all the way back in my second or third video ever in this channel, and it's this concept of a DI installer. Now, what do I mean by that? Here I have a simple API that deals with movies. I have like controllers, repository services, yada, yada, yada. But the important thing is in this installers folder and this program.cs or startup.cs at the time. So what I used to do at the time is that if I wanted to register services in DI, what I would do is I would have an installer class which looked something like this. You have an API installer, for example, here, which implements the iInstaller interface, which I made, by the way. And then you can have the service collection and the i configuration in here to do all your wiring up. So you would logically group that section of DI and you would have your controllers, your API endpoint discovery and in Swagger Gen, which is all API concern in this single class. If I want to have my database related stuff and my repository stuff, I would have my data installer over here. And as you can see, it's very nice, isolated. And if I want something from configuration, I can use it. On the front end, all I would have to do is just say install services from assembly containing and I would point to a simple assembly marker, in this case, the program.cs to detect all installers in a given assembly. So that on surface level looks very nice. In fact, if I wanted to move this thing as well in its own installer, all I would have to do is copy it, go here and say something like application installer or a more appropriate name, maybe, and then say I installer implement basic members just add this here, say services goes here and here, add all the missing types and that is it. And now I can just go ahead and delete it. And the only line I have into my program.cs or startup.cs is this install services from assembly. And if I want to install something from another assembly, all I have to do is duplicate it, use a marker here for that assembly and could automatically be registered. And the way this worked is in this extension method, what I'm doing is I'm getting all the installer types that are exported. I'm checking whether they're an interface or not or abstract or not, then instantiating them and then casting them and then getting a list and then just for each around all of them and just install them. Now, why I stopped doing that? Well, it's for two reasons. The first one is visibility. I don't really know what is being registered here. Yes, something in another assembly or in my assembly will be registered, but I can't see it, which nowadays, as I grow as a developer, I like visibility more than magic. And this is certainly magic. The other issue I had, and I actually later solved it, but it was still confusing, is that because these are read based on the assemblies that are exported and the types and so on, I can't really guarantee the order that they're being looped around. So if for some reason, and you shouldn't really need it, but if for some reason you needed a specific order to happen, well, you couldn't control it. Now you're going to say, hey, Nick, just add in that installer interface an order parameter, but then you have to deal with thousands and make sure that everything falls in place and it's not very visible at all because there's nothing clear that tells you that this is the order of registration. So that's why I don't use it anymore. Now, what I use nowadays? Well, I use simple extension methods. So if I want to have a similar logical grouping of add API, what I would have is add API services and then an extension method on service collection. And what I would do on the front end or the program.cs is say builder.services.add API services. And that is it. And then that method has that same logical grouping idea, but now it's way more visible and I can explicitly control the order exactly how I want. I much prefer this approach, less magic, more visibility and more control to the developer. Now, the next thing I don't actually use anymore is a mapper. And there's a bit of an asterisk here. I'm going to explain in a second, but 
If you've seen my previous videos, especially those first videos, I would generally advocate for a mapper. So I even recently made a video explaining the performance differences between all different mappers or different mainstream mappers. And if you don't know what a mapper is, effectively you have an object here and an object here. They look similar. They have basically the same properties or similar property types. And you can map from one thing to another very, very effectively. So if I have, for example, here a Spotify album DTO, because that is the API contract data transfer object, and then I have my own Spotify album domain object, I can specify and say, hey, create a map between those two. And because the properties are named in a certain way, you will be actually able to just say dot map and map from one object to the other. Now, this idea of a mapper starts great and it looks great as well because you don't actually have to write any code. In some cases, you have to write some configuration. In most cases, you don't. For example, Mapster doesn't need that and a few others. But the idea that I can simply have a single line of code or define some mappings and then forget about it is very powerful. It is also ultimately the downfall because as you start changing things, things can get out of sync. And if you don't have the right things in place, most of these things won't fail at compile time and they will fail in runtime. Now, sure, you can have unit tests checking everything, but I've seen this done wrong so many times and it has caused problems so many times because even if you have unit tests, you have to have the right pipeline to actually execute and fail on deployment. There's just too many moving parts here to make this a reliable value proposition. Now, the interesting thing about this is that now with something like Mapperly, for example, which as you can see over here is source generated, most of that problem with dealing with things that can't be caught during compile time is largely solved and it's actually very, very efficient. Mapperly will try to generate the most efficient code to do the mapping as possible. But even then, personally, for what I'm doing, is I'm actually writing my own mappers. Not only do I have full control of what's going on here and I can do even more crazy things if I really care about performance between my mapping, but also controlling the mapping in that way prevents me from going ahead to do stupid things like inject services into my mapper, inject business logic into my mapper when it shouldn't be. The mapper should be doing one thing. You have object A, object B, map that thing to that other thing. And that is it. If you're injecting services, resolving things, doing fancy stuff, you're doing it wrong. You're messing up your code. So by being able to fully control what's going on here manually, yes, I have to write those things myself. But first, I only do that once. So fine. And I get a clear view of what's happening and I don't try to use fancy features of mappers that will lead me to bad code. I much prefer this manual mapping approach myself. The last thing I don't do anymore is using guard clauses like this. So I've made a video on this in the past. A guard clause is effectively something like this, where you can have the guard dot against and guard against a scenario, for example, guard against a negative or negative or zero and so on uh, out of range, for example. And actually .NET, especially in .NET 8, has more native uh, argument uh, guard clauses. For example, throw if null here, this is a guard clause. Throw if null or empty, this is a guard clause. You have a condition and then you throw based on that condition. You throw an exception. Now, the reason why I don't like that approach is because I don't like throwing exceptions for these types of concerns. Yes, I know that some people doing programming in a certain way might prefer to do this this way. And later in the pipeline, they have a filter that catches that and converts it into something like a response, a bad request response. But in my code, exceptions like this have no place. They're too much of a hassle. Exceptions should be exceptional. And in cases like this, I'd rather validate in other places with valid code and use something like a result object or a discriminated union with one off to return things properly. I don't do this anymore. Packages that offer this functionality for me and they wrap it in a nice fluent API. Yes, they look cool when you read up the code, but when you run the code, when you execute the code, and when you follow the flow of said code can get very problematic. Because yes, if this is now null or white space here, this name parameter, this is going to throw. Where is this thing going to be caught? I don't know. It could be anywhere. So it's way less explicit, way less visible. I really, really do not like this or packages like this. I'm still fine using the debug class to use something like debug.assert because this will actually be removed during compile time. But doing guard clauses like this, not a fan. I don't use it. I don't like it. 
I prefer to be way more explicit and have a flow that I can actually follow in my applications. But now I want to know from you, what are the best practices that you are not using anymore in .NET and C Sharp and why are you not using them? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this possible. If you want to support me, you can find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, click the like this and the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.